The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up. They were doing everything in their power to give my dad a chance to live. A cancer patient. I really felt there was no hope at that point. Who flatlined in the OR. He was essentially dead. Watch as he goes 55 minutes without a pulse. I wasn't ready for him to go. And makes a full recovery. And we're all just looking at each other going, how is this even possible? On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. On Monday, Mexico will be hit with import tariffs if it doesn't act to slow down the record number of illegal immigrants crossing into the United States. One of the top Border Patrol officials says he's never seen anything like it in his 24 years on the job. Jennifer Wishon brings us the story from Washington. It's a critical day for Mexico. Here in Washington, Mexican officials are at the State Department trying to stave off President Trump's threat of tariffs. This is America's Border Patrol agents face a historic influx of migrants. <laughs> Despite President Trump's stepped up enforcement at the border, arrests have nearly doubled over this point last year. The acting commissioner of Customs and Border Protection says, we are in a full-blown emergency, and I cannot say this stronger, the system is broken. And there's no end in sight. This migrant says he left Honduras because life there is very difficult. Another says Mexican officials let this group cross the border because they're peaceful. You shouldn't be able to walk through Mexico. If you look at that, that's really an invasion without the gun. And now reports indicate ISIS is eyeing America's southern border. Homeland Security today uncovered at least one plot to send ISIS fighters into the U.S. by way of the nation's poorest border with Mexico. We need Mexico to do more. Mexico offered to deploy thousands of National Guard troops to its border with Guatemala to help control the flow of migrants, but U.S. officials say that's not enough. The Hill reports the president is ready to declare a national emergency so he can impose major new tariffs on Mexico, a move that will likely face legal challenges. The president plans to levy a 5% tariff on all Mexican goods starting Monday, a tax that would increase 5% each month, maxing out at 25% this fall if a deal isn't reached. That's making Mexican farmers and manufacturers nervous and uniting some Democrats and Republicans who fear economic repercussions here in the U.S. I'm afraid that it might endanger some American jobs. It's not a way to deal with immigration. President Trump says he's forced to take action because Congress is unwilling to address immigration, calling the politics of it all a vicious business. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Well, it's ultimately the source of the problem. Congress hasn't uh, hasn't acted, hasn't put together a comprehensive immigration bill. What to do with this problem? And it's been a long-standing problem. This goes back several administrations. This isn't something new. We've had a giant "Help Wanted" sign on our so southern border, and uh, people have responded to it. We now have one of the largest uh, humanitarian crisis the Western Hemisphere has ever seen happening right now in Venezuela, where millions of people are being forced by starvation to leave that country. Add to it the unemployment in Guatemala and Honduras. Those governments have been saying for some time now, please help us with investment. Please help us have jobs in our own co country so our people can live. And so it's no wonder they're trying to get to the United States and these caravans of people uh, trying to cross our border. And it is an emergency. You can't uh, understate the incredible need here. But Congress hasn't acted. And it's not just a Democrat versus Republican thing. When the Republicans controlled the Congress for the first two years of the current administration, there wasn't anything that moved through in terms of comprehensive immigration reform. What do we do with the problem? So the president has said we're going to start with, with this tariff. Um, the problem with tariffs is it introduces uncertainty into economic systems. So if you're a business owner and you're looking to invest, uh, do you make that investment now in face of, well, I can't determine what the ultimate price of the goods are going to be? 
Uh, so if you're manufacturing things in Mexico, if it's a joint effort, partly in Mexico, partly in the United States, you're just going to stop until the political uncertainty gets cleared up. That impacts us all. It's going to impact the stock market. It's going to impact our retirement accounts. But more importantly, it's going to impact jobs. So what do we do here? How do we get rid of this logjam? How do we actually have cooperation between Democrats and Republicans? We all need to unite. Our, our country faces multiple problems on multiple fronts. And all we want to do is have politics of hate and division. Uh, it's time for us to heal all of that. And let's start getting the job done. In other news, Democratic presidential frontrunner Joe Biden has reversed himself on a major issue. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. That's right, Gordon. Biden is backtracking, changing his position on taxpayer-funded abortions. Only two days ago, Biden's campaign confirmed he, at the time, still supported the Hyde Amendment, which bans federal taxpayer dollars paying for abortions. After coming under intense criticism from feminist and pro-abortion groups, two pillars in the Democratic base, the former VP announced the change. Biden, a Roman Catholic, said he makes no apologies for his earlier position, adding that after recent statewide efforts to restrict abortions, he no longer supports the amendment because, quote, circumstances have changed. While well, the case of a Washington state florist who was fined for refusing to make a floral arrangement for same for same sex wedding could go back to the Supreme Court. Thursday, Washington State's high court stood by a 2017 ruling against Baronel Stutzman. Responding to an order by the Supreme Court to review the decision in light of a similar case in Colorado, the Washington State justices said state agencies were not prejudiced against Stutzman's religious beliefs, and they ruled lower courts weren't hostile to religion in their rulings against her. Stutzman plans to appeal again to the Supreme Court. Well, in addition to the inspirational ceremonies at Normandy Thursday to commemorate D-Day, another gathering took place, this one at the World War II Memorial on the National Mall here in Washington. As Paul Strand reports, there's also a move to make a famous prayer a more permanent part of future remembrances there. Troops past and present and members of a grateful nation gathered here at the World War II Memorial to remember that June 6th turning point in the global conflict. 160,000 troops landed and within a couple weeks over a million landed and within a couple months they liberated Paris and within 11 months they had Hitler bottled up there in Berlin. President Roosevelt frequently talked to the nation during his fireside chats, but during D-Day he didn't talk, he prayed for those in the fierce fight. Some will never return. Embrace these, Father and receive them, thy heroic servants, into thy kingdom. President Trump invoked FDR's prayer as he marked the 75th anniversary Wednesday in Portsmouth, England. Here in Washington, Ohio Senator Rob Portman is among many Americans who want to see that prayer placed permanently here at this memorial. It is a huge part of American history, in my view. On this incredibly important day, a president of the United States chose to invoke the Almighty. He chose to use prayer rather than a speech to inspire the country to provide protection for these troops. Chris Long of the Christian Alliance of America points out there's no mention of God at the memorial. The World War II memorial is unique in that way. It's uh, one of the uh, memorials that does not have a scripture verse, a prayer, or reference to God anywhere on it. So the idea legislatively seven years ago was to add FDR's D-Day prayer in its entirety here at the memorial. You go to Normandy, what do you see? Crosses, 9,000 of them, and stars of David. These were men and women of faith. And so it's only proper that uh, there should be some acknowledgement of faith at the World War II memorial in Washington, D.C. Long said of FDR. He actually hand wrote the prayer, and it's estimated that 100 million people worldwide heard that prayer that morning. Some may question adding the prayer to this memorial. But it would always remind the nation that at that destiny-changing moment, America knew it had to rely on more than men and military might. It had to rely on God. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from the World War II Memorial. Thanks, Paul. Well, the city of Virginia Beach hosted a service Thursday night to remember those killed in the mass shooting at the city's government complex last Friday. Heather Sells reports on a night that brought out the best in a community that's witnessed the worst. Just one week after 12 people lost their lives, the city of Virginia Beach hosted a service for people of all faiths to remember. Several thousand people attended, and while anyone could enter Rock Church, police surrounded the building both on foot and horseback. 
service provided an opportunity for people to mourn. We come together as one community with no division. We grieve with the families of the victims whose lives will never be the same. It provided prayers and reflections from a variety of faiths. May our faith in your sovereignty, God, in your love and your care, give us the humility to recognize that we do not, nor may we ever know why some things happen. And it honored Rich the victims. Middleton. City council Barry members led a moment Boone. of silence for Gale. each of the 12 who lost their lives. At the end of the service, the audience gave repeated standing ovations as the vice mayor praised the first responders. Our wonderful city employees have stepped up and they've stepped up big time. From the police officers who rushed to the sound of gunfire, to the sheriff's deputies who took control of the city and locked it down. Our emergency response was dynamic, it was impressive, and it saved lives. Officials also noted that many are still working, investigators trying to understand what motivated the shooter, chaplains supporting victims' families, and city officials encouraging Virginia Beach to move forward. When you walk through a storm. Heather Sell, CBN News. Gordon, I watched last night and it really was a beautiful and touching service. Well, it was a time for all of us to come together as a community here in Virginia Beach to recognize that in the face of this kind of evil, we stand as one and we stand to mourn the, the horrible carnage, the number that were killed, to stand with their families, to let the families know we stand with you, we're going to be with you for the long haul, and then to honor the first responders. Here are people, when they heard gunfire, they ran to it in order to stop that, that horrible evil, to stop that government, to, to end this carnage. Uh, when they heard gunfire, they ran to it to help others, and we wanted to honor them. Uh, it was a night of unity, a night of the whole community coming together and saying, we stand strong, and Virginia Beach is strong. Terry? Well, coming up, a real-life Rocky story. An undersized boxer becomes world champion, and that wasn't even his greatest victory. I was also given two to three months to live. And the only thing I can say is, babe, we got to pull the gloves out one more time. This is going to be our biggest fight. Watch as Arthur Flash Johnson beats the odds a second time when we come back. With films such as Raging Bull, Million Dollar Baby, and the Rocky franchise, boxing movies have been box office gold. But you don't have to go to the theaters to see these stories of focus and grit. John Jessup introduce us, introduces us to an unlikely underdog who became a boxing world champion. Arthur Johnson's story can be likened to a tale of two cities. On one side of the mighty Mississippi River lies St. Louis, Missouri, flanked by its famous Gateway Arch and a busy downtown. And on the other side sits East St. Louis, Illinois, a struggling city known for its high crime rate and its high unemployment rate, nearly twice that of the national average. Those harsh realities make it difficult for East St. Louisans to find their way out of the city and attain their dreams. So this is the old neighborhood? This is the old neighborhood. Growing up in the projects, Arthur inherited a fighting spirit. That same spirit helped him resist the pull of drugs and violence with dreams about going places. I would imitate the broadcaster. I said, there goes Arthur, there goes Arthur, and he, <laughs> he lands a right hand, another right hand by Johnson. Inspired by Muhammad Ali, he took up boxing by the time he was 10, joining a club by forging a permission slip. I signed it myself because you were supposed to have your mother signed. <laughs> my mother never signed it. Of course, later on, my mom would find out. And uh, she knew that uh, perhaps maybe I found something that was going to keep me out of trouble. The only problem, art size. 
It would play a recurring role throughout his career, apparent the very first time he put on the gloves. I was a small <laughs> guy, and this kid belted me with a shot, knocked me on my tush, and uh, I got back up, and I could hear in the crowd somebody say, don't quit, don't quit. Art listened and kept at it, eventually using his size to his advantage as a flyweight fighter, earning the nickname Flash due to his lightning fast punching combinations. And in that ring, you had thunder in both hands to be so small to hit so hard, man. At a small weight, 106 pounds, 112 pounds. It's not, that's not a lot, a lot of weight, but man, his power was exceptional for that weight class. He even trained with a man who coached the likes of George Foreman, Sugar Ray Leonard, and yes, Ali. But nobody can push a guy to be a fighter. You gotta want to be it. It's so weird that the years and years later that his manager would become my manager and we would be in the same boxing family. That was Angelo. Angelo Dante. Art excelled, becoming the first flyweight amateur to win three consecutive national titles, then amassing a total of 12, a record that still stands today. He also was the first American boxer to win the gold at the Goodwill Games and represented the U.S. at the 1988 Olympics. Still, Art had no idea life's biggest fight would take place outside of the ring. That was a hard one. That diagnosis came out of nowhere. It was going to require um, uh, the hand of God. I'd never taken a punch, and I know he has. And so it was like I got hit with a punch and the wind got knocked out of me. After Arthur retired, doctors diagnosed him with APL, a rare form of blood cancer. I was also given two to three months to live. As his health declined, the family leaned on their faith in God and support from their church. And LaTanya reminded her husband of the fighter within. I remember when he was laying in that bed in that hospital. And the only thing I could say is, babe, we got to pull the gloves out one more time because this is gonna be our biggest battle. This is gonna be our biggest fight. After more than a month in the hospital, six months of chemo, and five long years of recovery, Arthur beat cancer and punched back, eager to make a difference. Here we go again. Yep. Good, beautiful. We toured the Flash Boxing Gym and Educational Center during construction, where he told us he planned to do more of this. On the ball of your feet, on the ball of your feet, right. Good. Using boxing to train Good. young hopefuls, Good. the lessons he's the learned feet, inside and outside the ring. Beautiful. That's what I see. Beautiful. I see him leaving a piece Good. of himself in the next generation. Through the gym and foundation, he's helping these hometown kids dream big. To the left, to the left, to the left. Something to the left. both his to students the right, right, and their right, parents the right, the right. appreciate. Well, my oldest son, he's become very athletic. His confidence is um, higher. Their organization, I believe, has changed our lives. He's a good role model. Father figure, he's a good, just a good person all in general. You know, this city need more people like him. You know, this stuff that he's doing for us, and he's not getting paid to do it. For him to be doing a lot of this out the kindness of his heart, and that's a blessing. So I'm excited about the lives that we're touching, the lives that we're going to change. And uh, we've made some champions in the physical form. But more importantly, I think we're going to make champions in life. Arthur Johnson's fight now outside of the ring is based on a simple premise. He's fighting for his hometown and for future generations, reminding young people if they can dream it, they can achieve it. John Jessup, CBN News, East St. Louis, Illinois. What a wonderful lesson for any young person, if you can dream it. Just, just giving back and giving back generationally. What a wonderful story of perseverance to first become a champion, then to overcome cancer, and now to say, I want to give back. You can find out more about the Author Johnson Foundation. All you have to do is go to our website, cbnnews.com. Terry? Up next, a high school student goes to a concert and here's a life-changing message. We need Christian lawyers who would be willing to go overseas to rescue sex trafficking victims, to advocate for the poor, the oppressed, the enslaved, and, and we needed more of them, is what they said to me. And I remember hearing that as an 11th grade student thinking, that's interesting. See how this young man became a voice for the voiceless when we return.
Ernie Walton wanted to be a Christian missionary. His father wanted him to be a lawyer. Today, both can say their dreams came true. That's because Ernie is now a global human rights attorney, thanks to Regent University. Lawyers have ends in, in just ways that others don't. And to be able to be an advocate, right, to be trained in the law, to advocate for rights for people, uh, it's, it's an incredible opportunity and means to serve and be that voice for the voiceless. Ernie Walton always knew God had plans for his life. Becoming an attorney wasn't one of them. Growing up in a Christian home, he respected his father's heart for business, Jesus, and passion for a sports outreach ministry called Push the Rock. So sort of a dream for him and really our family uh, to use a passion that we had, a uh, love of sports, combining it with, with the first love of, of the Lord and spreading the gospel. When I was 15, I went with my dad and my brothers. We went to Japan on a missions trip. We took a soccer team and, and it was a turning point in my life. I came back and said, Lord, all right, I give you my life. I surrender to what your call for me is. And I'm thinking, what could be better for the kingdom? than to be a full-time missionary and go overseas, spread the gospel, play soccer, you know, maybe I could play professionally. His father, on the other hand, saw something different, Ernie's aptitude for justice. But my dad, for whatever reason, he always would say to me, Ernie, we need more Christian lawyers in the world. We need more lawyers who are committed to, to bringing the gospel to the public square and who understand the law to advocate and, and advise nonprofits like Push the Rock. Still, Ernie dismissed his dad's prodding, unable to see how being an attorney could combine with his passion for missionary work. When I was in, in 11th grade, I went to a concert, and all the funding for this concert was going to a group called International Justice Mission. We needed Christian lawyers who would be willing to go overseas to rescue sex trafficking victims, to advocate for the poor, the oppressed, the enslaved, and, and we needed more of them, is what they said to me. And I remember hearing that as an 11th grade student, thinking, that's interesting. Apparently not interesting enough, Still set on serving at Push the Rock one day, Ernie went on to Houghton College in New York, where he studied business management and played soccer. Then on a missions trip to Costa Rica his junior year, Ernie began to doubt his plans for the future. I think I had this plan to work for Push the Rock. Is that really what I should be doing? And I'm just crying out to the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I remember sitting in my, my room in Costa Rica and, and the Lord just saying, Ernie, I I've told you, you know, for many years what you're supposed to do. Your dad has spoken your calling to you to be a Christian lawyer. You've heard about it through IJM, to be a Christian lawyer who's gonna advocate for the poor and the oppressed. So I called my dad and said, Dad, you're right. I need to go to law school. And he said, okay, I figured. The only thing left to do now was choose a school. Began to research and talk to people. And uh, of course found out that region academically was solid, was outstanding, was excellent. But it was a school committed to to teaching students from a Christian worldview, and that exceeded by far my expectations about the quality of legal education. After that first year, my mind was just transformed. He also found that perfect pairing between his aptitude for justice and his passion for sharing the love of Christ. Regent Law started something called the Center for Global Justice, and it was specifically designed for students like me who were coming to law school, feeling they were called not to be necessarily a traditional attorney, but an attorney who wanted to to do human rights work. I had the opportunity to, to serve as one of the first ever interns with the Center for Global Justice. Ernie met his wife, Lindsay, through Regent Law School. Shortly after graduation, they moved to California, where they both passed the bar and started working at a Christian firm. There was still something in my heart that said, the Lord's brought me here, but this isn't long-term. And I remember getting an email from Regent. There's a position now to, to serve as the administrative director of Regent Law Center for Global Justice. So I applied for the position. We just began to pray and pray, Lord, what do you have for us? I interviewed via Skype, and then a few days later was offered the job. We both came to the conclusion that this is a job, you know, that we absolutely felt called to take. Since then, Ernie has become a mentor to interns and students. He's also been instrumental in forging partnerships between Regent Center for Global Justice and organizations like International Justice Mission, the National Institute of Family and Life Advocates, and the European Center for Law and Justice. Our mission is always to work alongside other Christian human rights organizations that are doing this work on the front lines. Being a missionary and being a lawyer, there's not even division, they, they marry together so well. And that's what I've learned at Regent Law School and of course doing this work. 
God provides funding every year for, for us to go to Uganda to fight child sacrifice, to go to France to fight uh, with the European Center for Law and Justice and advocate for persecuted uh, Christians throughout Europe and the Middle East. Some stay right here in the States in DC working to fight child sex trafficking. It's so incredible that the Lord would use us to do justice for some of these victims. He is a God of justice. And so reinforcing that here at Regent with our students is just one of the greatest joys I have, is discipling our students to think biblically about these human rights issues, that we have a responsibility and we will work and we will not stop until justice is done. I hope Ernie's story in inspires you, that you know, when you have a dream, when you have a vision, then go about getting equipped so that you can fulfill that dream and that vision. For Ernie, it was going to law school. For some, it's, can you go to divinity school? Can you go to a school of education if you want to become a teacher? Uh, can you go into the school of psychology and counseling if you want to uh, help people who have uh, very real pressing issues in their life? But you need the, the equipping. You need the training. And Ernie is just one of 25 thousand graduates of Regent University. It started and it started very humbly and very small 40 years ago. And there's a wonderful story behind it where my father is in California. He's speaking and uh, he pauses to get a meal. Back then he was on one of these crazy diets where he, all he could eat was cantaloupe and cottage cheese. And so he's having his cantaloupe and cottage cheese and he's bowing his head to pray over his cantaloupe and cottage cheese. And he hears God tell him, build a school for my glory. Well, what a wonderful message to get from, from the Father. And what a wonderful thing to say, okay, God, I, I hear you and, and I will start. And here we are 40 years later, 25,000 graduates. What an incredible day. Well, with Father's Day coming up, what I want to do is honor my father, the father of Regent University. And we're going to have a special gift for the school that he loves in honor of him and in honor of, of Father's Day. A group of CBN donors has gotten together and said, we want to issue a challenge. And because of its 40th, 40th anniversary, that challenge is $40,000. There's an extra hundred on it, but it's $40,000 in honor of the 40th anniversary of Regent University and in honor of Father's Day. So if you want to give a gift to honor my father, to honor Regent University, to advance its mission in the world, and if you call now, it's going to be matched dollar for dollar up to $40,000. Call 1-800-700-7000. You can go online to cbn.com slash Regent Gift and give your gift to Regent University. And what your gift will do is it will help us train more people like Ernie, Christian leaders to change the world. And it will give my father a wonderful Father's Day that he'll never forget. So do it now. Call us 1-800-700-7000. Say yes. I want to give to Regent University. I want to honor Pat Robertson for his faithfulness over 40 years, for him listening to the voice of the Lord and saying, yes, Lord, uh, here, I, here I am. Send me. Uh, if you want to start a university, I'll, I'll go ahead and start it. Uh, be a part of it. Be a part of honoring him. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, her husband was having emergency surgery when the doctors delivered news that no one wants to hear. He said to me that nothing they were doing was working, um, that they couldn't get a heartbeat and that there was nothing that was working. See how this man survived after dying in the operating room when we return. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News break. U.S. and Russian warships nearly collided this morning in the Philippine Sea. The Pentagon says a Russian destroyer made an unsafe move against the USS Chancellorsville. Take a look at this picture released by the Defense Department. Analysts say the wake shows the Russian vessel headed for the U.S. ship before making a sharp turn coming to within 50 to 100 feet and causing the Navy cruiser to take quick action to avoid a collision. The Pentagon says it considers Russia's, Russia's action 
quote, unsafe and unprofessional. Well, CBN's Operation Blessing is helping families in Zimbabwe have access to clean drinking water once again after a devastating cyclone destroyed parts of the African nation a few months ago. Fourteen members of one small church died from the storm, and many others lost everything. Survivors have struggled to find water, often drinking from contaminated sources just to stay alive. Operation Blessing volunteers distributed handheld water purifiers to give people the clean, safe water they needed. One pastor said, I want to thank you very much, Operation Blessing. May God really bless you. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting its website at ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. Dunn was getting ready to go home. He was about to be discharged from the hospital after he endured major surgery. But the day he was supposed to be released, Tony's heart stopped beating, and it would be almost an hour before it started again. The diagnosis alone for pancreatic cancer was devastating. I just felt there was no hope. I really felt there was no hope at that point. In 2013, Beverly Dunn's husband, Tony, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Beverly is a nurse and knew the odds of long-term survival were slim. Usually when pancreatic cancer is found, it's found way too late. I didn't really see an outcome for it other than death. Two months later, Tony underwent a Whipple procedure, a radical surgery that removes parts of the stomach, pancreas, gallbladder and small intestine. Tony's son Justin says his dad was eager to go home after the surgery. Every time we visited, he was, was always focused on doing what he had to do, getting up and walking around um, to do what he could do to speed his recovery along as quickly as he could so that he could get back to, get back to normal life. Unknown to everyone, he was allergic to the blood thinner Hepron. The day he was to be released, Tony struggled to breathe due to clotting in his lungs. Then he suffered a pulmonary embolism. Nurse Bill Bolton was there when Tony's heart suddenly stopped beating. There was no pulse uh, and he was not breathing on his own. If the nurses I was working with and myself, if we stopped pumping on his chest, he didn't have a heart rhythm. He was essentially dead. A team of doctors descended on Tony's room in an effort to revive him. Meanwhile, calls went out to family and friends to pray for Tony. His daughter, Tara, remembers getting the call. I fell to the floor, and I just cried out, um, please, Jesus. And that's all I could say. I just knew that there was power in that name. Our family and friends were beginning to gather. Uh, they were in the room with us. We were wall to wall, people that had heard what was going on and joined us. Prayer was what we had, and we knew that God would hear us. I knew that our Creator, all powerful, had the ability to intervene in my dad's circumstances right then. And um, in my heart, I was still holding on to hope. 30 minutes into the code, a doctor came out to update the family. He said to me that nothing they were doing was working, um, that they couldn't get a heartbeat, and that there was nothing that was working. As life-saving measures continued, Beverly and Justin were allowed into the room. Very apparent during those few moments in the room that uh, um, they were doing everything in their power to give my dad a chance to live. I felt like Tony was already gone. His eyes were open. They had a glazed over look um, as if nothing was there. But I bent down to him and I asked him, just please don't leave, just don't leave. At that time, I wasn't ready for him to go. 55 minutes after Tony's heart quit beating, his doctor came out of the room once again to talk with Beverly. He had a really puzzled look on his face, a really questioning look on his face. And he said, um, you have hope. We have a heartbeat. Uh, almost like the words that he was speaking, he was hardly believing. Miraculously, Tony's heart was beating on its own again. But now, 
More challenges lay ahead, as Tony faced the possibility of brain damage due to lack of oxygen during the code. The longer a code transpires or the more time that goes on during a code, the more likely that the person that is being coded is going to have some kind of uh, brain injury due to not, to not efficient compression of the heart. It was nearly certain he would have some level of brain damage. Three days later, Tony started moving his hands as if trying to communicate. His daughter Tara got a paper and pen. Beverly asked him if he knew what had happened and why he was there. And he wrote pulmonary embolism with perfect handwriting and perfectly spelled. And we're all just looking at each other going, how is this even possible? You know, nobody anticipated that at all. At that point, we knew uh, he's all there. We're just waiting for him to, to progress forward and we'll talk to him in a little bit. To the doctor's amazement, Tony survived without any brain damage. Family, friends, and hospital staff were amazed at how God was with them and had answered their prayers. God intervened in everything we needed for his healing. And the promises that he gave 2,000 plus years ago are still relevant today. Where two or three are gathered, he will be there. And he was, he, he showed up in a big way. My own personal feeling is, is that it was a divine intervention that um, God was saying, I'm not done. More than five years have passed since his surgery and miraculous survival. Follow-up scans have revealed Tony is cancer-free with no need for chemo or radiation. He says he's thankful for new life in his body and his soul. I have a confidence in God that that I didn't have before, and it's not, it goes beyond faith. You know, faith, faith is what you don't see, and it's as though now he made my faith sight. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm thankful to God for what he's done. I am so thankful for believers in prayer that were around us, that took us to God. We felt the love of God because of their presence and because of their willingness to serve our family. I do believe that the key to what happened with me rests in, in the faith of those who surrounded me. Uh, they fought for me when I was unable to fight for myself. You know, this is why God puts us in family. You heard it said so many times in just the last few sentences that they that the Dunn family shared that they took us to God and they lifted our faith when we weren't able to. God puts us together because we need each other and he wants us to be there for each other. You know, prayer changes things, but he says as that promise that was mentioned that where two or more are gathered, I'll be there in the midst of them. I hear what they're praying for. So today we wanna to take some time to pray for you. We know that you have your own specific needs. And so we wanna take time to share some further reports with you to build your faith, but also to pray for you. So stay with us to do that. This is Emily. She lives in Eufaula, Alabama. She suffered from damaged facial nerves, which caused her head to involuntarily shake. Her doctor recommended Botox injections. One day she was watching this program and Gordon said, someone has a nerve condition that is causing problems. Well, Emily claimed the word and she stopped shaking right away. She never did need those Botox shots. Well, here's Lisa, Lord. Hermitage, Tennessee. She had vision issues. She, she had trouble getting the correct eye prescription. And then she was watching the 700 Club. And Terry, you said you have an issue with your eyes. It's odd. Whatever it is, you have trouble getting the right lenses to be able to see clearly. God is correcting that for you right now. And after praying, Lisa's eyes were healed. Well, let's go back to Tony's story. If you know anything about um, cancer, you know that when you get a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer, you've got trouble. Uh, the survival rate on that is the lowest of all the cancers. And the reason is you usually catch it too late. You usually catch it after it's spread. So here's Tony and he's got that diagnosis. And then on top of it, he gets an allergic reaction to one of the mem medicines he's on, pulmonary embolism, and his heart stops. Now he's dead 
for 55 minutes. Just wrap your head around that. He, he's dead. But God is a God of resurrection. And he is a God of resurrection for you. Now, Tony now says, I've got a whole new level. You know, faith is the evidence of things not seen. I've seen. Uh, I know what I'm looking at. Uh, I know the promises, and when I see them, I know they're real. I don't have to guess anymore. Uh, I don't have to, you know, drum up anything. I, I, I rely on that. The wonderful thing, and it's great news, you can rely on them now. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to guess. You don't have to say, is this going to work for me? Realize God stands by his word. When people try to tell me that somehow or other I've got faith, I say, no, 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 no. I don't have faith. What I've got is I know some great facts. And the fact is Jesus dwelt on the earth and he lived a sinless life. His blood is divine. And he shed his blood for me. And by his stripes, I am healed. And he didn't stop there. He was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead. That same resurrection power is available to me. And then to really top it all off, he is right now at the right hand of the Father. And what is he doing? He ever lives to intercede for you. So that means Jesus is praying for you. These are wonderful facts. Let those facts settle over you. Let them settle over any disease, any problem, any issue in your life. Let those facts settle in. And then you can trust him. You can rely on him. Let Jesus be your faith. Don't try to drum up anything. Just let him be your faith. And you have all the faith you need. Now, we're going to pray for you. And what Tony said, when I was unable to pray, I had others praying for me. So we're going to do that. We're going to create a great circle of prayer. If you have a need, we're going to pray for you. If you don't have a need, wonderful. Praise God for that. But join us in prayer. Let's create a great circle of prayer. And this wonderful verse, when two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. These are the words of Jesus. Let's rely on them. Let's lean into them. Let's create a great prayer army, and let's see miracles today. Lord, we lift the needs of the audience to you, and we just claim your blood and your sacrifice. We claim that by your stripes we are healed. We were healed 2,000 years ago. When you said it's finished on the cross, you finished it for all time. So we come to you with our disease, with our infirmity, with our pain, with our trouble, with our loneliness, with our mental confusion. We come to you with everything, and we leave it at the cross. And we declare over ourselves, I am healed now. In Jesus' name, I am restored. I am raised into newness of life. And I have this new life every single morning. Be with us, Lord God. Stretch forth your hand to do miracles today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone named Tina. You have terrible pain in your right elbow. And God has just healed that, completely restored the joint. Uh, everything associated with that pain is gone forevermore. You're able to fully use that joint in your right arm. In Jesus' name, be healed and be set free. Terry? There's a woman, you... <sighs> you've been declared medically barren. You are not able to bear children. But God says this day, you will bear a child. And you're to know that this is not something the doctors misdiagnosed. It's, it's not something that was a mistake. It's because God has opened your womb and you will be a mother. Lord, Lord, we pray for all couples who are struggling with infertility. And we just pray over them that you would give them to the power yes. to give life. 
Right. The ability to give life, the ability to nurture life, full term, healthy babies. Mm. Your command over us, be fruitful and multiply. We receive your command with joy now. And we declare over ourselves, multiply, multiply, multiply. The power to give life is resident in us now. Uh, there's some people you, you've been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and you're asking, please say that. Please say pancreatic cancers. Others who are saying, I have cancer, please say cancer. So in Jesus name, be healed. Cancer cells no longer reproduce. Normal, healthy cells replace them. All cancer cells dry up and go away now in Jesus name. Be healed, have new energy, new vitality. Jesus came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And we proclaim life over you. You shall not die, but live and declare the glory of the Lord. God. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for all you, you do for us, your sacrifice, your love, your grace, your peace. May it be multiplied to all of us today. For we ask it in Jesus name. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share in your good report. Give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. If you need prayer, we're here for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us. It's our honor, our privilege to pray for you. We'll be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Well, today we're launching the Regent University Father's Day Challenge in honor of Pat Robertson. We're going to match your gifts up to $40,100. So call our toll-free number if you'd like to be a part of Blessing Pat. It's 1-800-700-7000. Or you can visit cbn.com slash Regent Gift and wish Pat a happy Father's Day with a gift to Regent University. It's going to be an amazing legacy of his life one day, and he's done an amazing work there. It's an amazing leg legacy already. Yeah. <laughs> 25,000 graduates. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Go dad. Exactly. Well, time for one email question, I think. So we're going to take this one from Edward who says, I have a license to conceal and carry a gun and I've gone through training. I'm not in law enforcement. I'm just an average law abiding citizen. In light of all the mass shootings that happen across the country, including in several places of worship, do you think it's okay to conceal and carry a gun to church every Sunday to protect myself and my family? I believe that if some of the people or at least one person was armed at these mass shooting sites, that many lives could have been saved by a legal legally armed citizen. Well, Edward, uh, number one, I think you need to consult your state laws on what's proper for concealed carry. Um, and, and that's just sort of a universal here. But another universal is unless you've had specialized training in how to deal with an active shooter event in a crowded venue, you may end up doing more harm than good. One of the problems in having weapons in church is that if you're trying to shoot a shooter, you might end up shooting a parishioner. Uh, and you don't want that. Uh, you don't want to be living with that and living with the knowledge of that. But I appreciate what you're trying to do. I appreciate your concern. What I encourage pastors to do is create security and create trained security. Uh, don't just... Um, put this together haphazardly. Make sure they have specific training on active shooter situations so that they know what to do. And that training needs to be regular and ongoing. It's not something you just pick up. It's something that's very stressful. So please get the training. Please provide security. Here's a word from Ephesians. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you.